Our speaker for tonight is this amazing, amazing person, Katie Robbins. She's the executive director of the of Physicians for National Health program here in New York. She's been leading the, 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 the drive for single payer universal health care in New York State. Please give, give her a round of applause. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Progressive Coders has been so generous in donating support to our efforts to win universal health care. And I've been so grateful to meet Rafi. I read about him in a book, actually, <laughs> <laughs> that I had like just finished. And then he contacted us. And I was like, oh, this guy is famous. Thank you for being oh, touched. Wow. And then also my one of my mentors here, Len Rodberg, is like who I first learned about single payer from. And I started working on this issue about 10 years ago. I moved to New York right after Sicko came out. How many people have seen that movie, Sicko by Michael Moore? Um, I highly recommend it actually. Um, not that much has, has changed in regard to challenges people have in accessing healthcare, despite a lot of good things that have happened since expanding coverage through the Affordable Care Act. I'm gonna dig into uh, some of those details tonight. Um, but if you were like me, today was kind of a roller coaster of a day in healthcare reform. Uh, what's going on in DC is really scary. Um, what we learned, just to recap, is that the effort to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act has failed. Uh, they can't get the votes. And the effort to just straight out repeal the Affordable Care Act um, and not replace it with anything, like come up with a plan later, or who knows, uh, very big. Three uh, women senators, Republican senators, came out saying there's no way they would vote for that. Um, so effectively it's dead. So we may hear rumblings still of a procedural vote to try to pass that straight out repeal with no replacement um, sometime in the next week, but they, they don't have the votes to move forward. Um, so that's great. Ha <laughs> ha! Yay! <laughs> Really, the, the bill would have done, both of those options would have been devastating. People would, millions of people would have lost health insurance. People would die because they couldn't access care. Um, and meanwhile, um, you know, since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we've had, you know, record expansion of health insurance. But I, what I've decided to do with my presentation tonight is actually try to do a, a bit of an overview of the data that the group I work for, Physicians for a National Health Program, has you know, done research on over a few decades now to show that there's systemic problems in our for-profit market-based health insurance system that even these current negotiations in DC, unfortunately, whether they pass or fail, don't, don't address the larger systemic problems. And there's incredible knowledge in this room tonight. So I'm really excited about the discussion to follow. Um, just a little bit more about my my organization, my, blah, blah, my organization, Physicians for a National Health Program. I work with the New York Metro chapter. It's a membership-based group with 21,000 physician members across the country. And I just feel so privileged to work with doctors who are on the right side of history here, who support the right to health care, who want to have a system uh, that prioritizes their patient care instead of profits for companies. And the research that PNHP has done over the years has really driven um, healthcare reform efforts for the good. Um, so I'm excited to share that with you tonight. Um, but before I get too far, I thought I would show you two examples of some video projects that volunteer activists and creatives have, have done for us that I think do a great job of highlighting the issue, making it personal, and getting to some of the wonkiness without me. Just the first person we're gonna hear from is Sarah Bednarik, who is a Brooklynite. Uh, she also likes healthcare very much, the people in the room. And uh, she's actually on Medicare. She doesn't fit the typical Medicare beneficiary profile. Usually people are over 65. Um, but this is a short clip of her talking about her healthcare experience. Being able to see somebody, um, you know, 10 years earlier or five years earlier. I might have had a possibility for a cure. My name is Sarah Bednarik. Uh, I have stage four cancer. I am on Medicare and I'm an artist. I had no health care before I became sick. 
I think it was about a thousand dollars a month for somebody buying it on the open market, um, which is just too much. So I hadn't been to a doctor in about 10 years and it happened gradually. I at first didn't really notice, but I began to start um, cutting things out of my diet because I couldn't poop. I thought I had food poisoning because I was vomiting a lot. So the people I lived with, my friends, they made me go to the emergency room after about a week. It turned out that my intestines were blocked. At that point, they didn't know what it was, so they had scheduled a colonoscopy. They started asking me for money, like almost as soon as I was conscious. And I didn't have any, and they sent the uh, social worker to be like, where, how are you gonna pay us? And I was like, I, f I don't know. <laughs> the hospital sent me a lot of bills. Like, I think the first one I got was like $57,000. The amount of money that it costs to treat cancer is astronomical. Unless you're like a billionaire, you, there's no way that you'd be able to easily afford cancer treatment. My mother had arrived at that point and um, through her Really hard work, actually. Um, she managed to get me signed up for Medicaid, um, which was necessary. Once Medicaid kicked in, then all of that just went away, and they paid for it. No one tells me which doctor I can go to. My oncologist has saved my life three times now, and the idea of maybe, for example, an insurance company telling me I can't see her anymore, that's awful. Um, a lot of times, my friends, for example, will get huge bills or they just won't, you know, they won't have met their deductible yet and they'll be paying out of pocket for all of their whatever it is they need. Or they'll avoid going to the doctor at all because they can't pay the deductible. And that's not the case with Medicare or Medicaid. If the New York Health Act is anything like Medicare, which it is, <laughs> um, it would help the public so much because they wouldn't have to deal with the kind of stuff that I haven't had to deal with for a while. Everybody should have that ability to make the right choices for themselves and not have some sort of corporate interest making those choices for them. Her story, I think, reflects uh, one that maybe we not all relate to in the extreme instance of being diagnosed with cancer. Uh, I think hearing people talk about their personal experiences and relating that to what we all deal with when we're worried about accessing care because we live in a country where it's a market-based system, um, Sarah does a great job of laying that out. and. Part of my pitch is that I think we all need to be more public about sharing our stories. I think it's one of our best weapons against the opposition, frankly. And the next short video I'm going to show you, I want to give a shout out to Ling in the back, part of many groups, including Action Books, that has been working with PNHP. Uh, she and her partner um, helped create this animation to sort of get at what it is we're talking about in New York State with the New York Health Act. So, Hopefully, all will go well with this. There's an epidemic that millions of New Yorkers and people across the country are suffering from, and you may be suffering from it too. It's private insurance-induced stress disorder, P-I-I-S-D, or PISD. It's a condition brought on when you get a bill in the mail that your health insurance premiums have gone up 20% or more or when you realize you have a 50% coinsurance even after meeting your deductible of $3,000, or when you don't have insurance at all because you can't afford it, or when your insurance plan drops your doctor and you have to find a new one, or after spending countless hours on the phone arguing and pleading with customer service after you've been denied treatment. It occurs after your bank account has been drained of your life savings to pay for care, or after seeing a loved one maimed or die from an otherwise manageable illness. But there is a cure, and that is the New York Health Act, guaranteed health care for all of us. The New York Health Act eliminates wasteful private insurance companies and replaces them with one public program that is accountable to us, the people. We can have an improved Medicare for All-like plan for New Yorkers. 
Healthcare that covers everyone as a right, as a public good, not as a commodity to be bought and sold on the marketplace. The New York Health Act would cover all medically necessary care, including vision, dental, mental health, reproductive health, prescriptions, and long-term care. 98% of New Yorkers would save money on health care. It would be funded fairly with a progressive tax based on your ability to pay, instead of forcing people to pay as much as possible and go bankrupt in order to get life-saving treatment. It will restore decision-making to the doctor and the patient, not the insurance company bureaucrat. The New York Health Act has passed the Assembly three times with huge majority support in the last three years. We only need one more senator to have the majority of the state Senate. How are we going to get across the finish line and make this a reality? You. We know the opposition is formidable. They have serious power and money. But we have the people. We need to win universal health care so that everyone can have the peace of mind that they and their loved ones, their neighbors, and their employees get the health care they need when they need it, without fear of going bankrupt. Join the fight and make sure that New York does the right thing. Call your state senator today. Tell them to support the New York Health Act, guaranteed health care for all of us. Sign up at nyhcampaign.org. So I was just so pleased that I was able to share this with, you know, this room of people who I'm sure would really appreciate the talent that went into that animation. Um, it actually was based on a stump speech that I do when I'm invited out to political clubs. So to like see that in animation form is amazing. And I think a really compelling short video that shows what this issue is, how we could win, and clearly we need everybody in this room and more to make it happen. And so, yeah, anybody in here suffering from this? <laughs> I know, I certainly have it. Um, so how bad are these private health insurance companies? You know, how, how bad is the system? One of our board members, who is a primary care doctor in Harlem, put together this infographic to try to capture how confusing our current healthcare system is. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the doctors and nurses that I work with have to function in this system that's chaotic and confusing. Um, it's based on funding from taxes that go to the government, but also our private premiums that go to private health insurance companies who focus on making lots of profit. Uh, they create tons of administrative waste. I'm going to dig into those numbers with you. And we have fragmented systems of private insurance. We have Medicaid that covers people under a certain income level. We have Medicare that covers people in a certain age group and with certain disabilities. There's other public programs that cover kids and veterans. And there's even another stream of funding for uncom uncompensated care, charity care for the uninsured that show up at hospitals and clinics all over the country that need help. And meanwhile, it's really a chaotic system to try to deliver quality healthcare in. So this is not new for anyone, but I thought you would appreciate that graphic. Um, and who do we have to blame? Well, this is one of our most popular um, memes that PNHP has shared on Facebook. It shows the CEO salaries of the top <laughs> six uh, private health insurance companies. Um, and literally, if you can't see the screen, I mean, these folks make more than most people do in a year in a single day. They are making a ton of money. You could also have an equally egregious meme of the pharmaceutical company CEOs. Insurance overhead, just providing the structure for private health insurance in this country is you know, anywhere from uh, two to four times what it is in other countries. The insurance overhead is outrageous. And this is something that PNHP has tried to show over, over the years of research, saying, look, we actually have these companies that prioritize huge administration overhead and profits. They actually refer to paying out for healthcare as their medical loss. That makes me really uncomfortable. I mean, their job is to make money. They're for-profit companies. Their job is to make money for their shareholders. That's their legal fiduciary responsibility. And they, frankly, they do it really well, but at what cost? If we compare um, the kind of high overhead in private health insurance companies with, say, our traditional Medicare program, which is an example of a single-payer healthcare system in this country, traditional Medicare overhead is about 2%, 2 to 3%. Um, 
And there are privatized Medicare plans called Medicare Advantage plans, and there uh, you'll see their profit and overhead get it closer to 14%. So we often hear, you've heard, I'm sure if you're following Bernie and the campaign, you hear the term Medicare for all, and really it's trying to capture this concept that you can prioritize paying for healthcare, not overhead, and have a high quality system that's popular. Um, Traditional Medicare, so that means that 98 cents of every dollar is going to pay for healthcare. And Medicare, remember, Medicare covers the sickest and oldest folks in our country and still does a pretty good job of it. We would certainly advocate for key improvements of Medicare, including its benefits package, and there is a cost sharing for patients. Um, but when we're just looking at the overhead, we have pretty compelling information. Now, over time, shows the growth of physicians and administrators from 1978 to 2015. And this thin blue line on the bottom is the growth of physicians. And the red shows the growth of administrators and managers, people who push paperwork, who don't provide actual care. So you can see this trend over time, the ballooning administrative cost of maintaining our chaotic system. And essentially, this is not new information, but if you look at the system as a whole, one out of every three dollars is going to not help care because it's propping up the billing and administration of not just insurance companies, but also doctors and hospitals <coughs> who have to keep up with them. So someone was talking about just that, the comparison of a Canadian physician practice who could have one person on staff to help with billing versus in this country, I'm not sure if you mentioned the number of staff, but you know, you go to a Canadian hospital and it really is one or two people who are <coughs> billing, and here it is an entire floor of folks dedicated to managing the paperwork. So it's it's a visible comparison. There's such a huge, huge administrative burden on our system. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, US hospitals, a study shows that out of eight, eight countries, US has the highest administration of hospitals uh, at about 25% on average. And meanwhile, we spend more than any other country in the world, that is where we are number one, but we, we have terrible health outcomes. Here, this chart shows actually that, you know, the total health spending is close to about $10,000 uh, per capita, and you can see it's double what many other countries spend. But if you look at this lighter blue line, that shows our public contributions to the healthcare system. Our we pay more in public dollars through our taxes than most countries who have universal health care. So we actually already pay for universal health care, but we don't get it. And that's part of what we're trying to argue, is that we have the resources at the system. The opposition will continue to hammer home that we cannot afford a universal health care program. But what we're arguing is we can't afford the current system. And drug companies are doing really well in this system too. So this chart shows over the last 20 years, the darker blue line is uh, drug company prop profits compared to the lighter blue, blue line, which is Fortune 500 companies' uh, profits. So they're doing really well in this system. And they always say, well, we need to charge so much money for pharmaceuticals. Uh, because we need to fund research and development. But here's the pie for research and development at 13% compared to what they spend on marketing and administration, 35%. Uh, profits, 18%. You know, a small portion of the pie is actually going to the research and development of new drugs, which we would certainly like to see change. And these headlines pop up from time to time. Drugs that have exploded in cost and at a huge burden to the patients. Um, so insulin over the last decade has tripled in cost. Again, they're for-profit companies. That's the way the game is played. So it's not surprising that the U.S. spends more on drugs than anywhere else. You can see the red line here. Per capita spending on prescription drugs compared to other industrialized countries. Other countries get to bargain. They get to use the Costco model. They get to say, we're one pair. We're buying in bulk. They can get it for cheaper. We, we don't allow our programs to do that. Medicaid actually can bargain down, but Medicare by law is forbidden to bargain for our drug costs because of Medicare Part D. So we don't allow our programs um, to actually take advantage of that kind of cost savings model. 
We really, if we went to a universal public program, that is one huge area where we would achieve significant savings in being able to just simply bargain for drugs and medical equipment. Medical equipment. This is another devious thing that insurers do to try to get more money out of your pocket or to try to avoid paying for care. They have different, basically, tiers for uh, their drug formularies. And you have to pay more to be able to access these pretty common typical drugs that help manage chronic conditions. So the no categories actually show that the drug is not available in tier one, which had, would have the lowest copay, which would be most beneficial to people who don't have a lot of money. And I work with doctors who anecdotally will say all the time they're trying to deal with patients and the formulary changes and suddenly the drug that had been covered, that had been working for that patient, is no longer available in that tier. It's just like a bureaucratic nightmare to try to keep patients on the right prescriptions and drugs. And it's not surprising that many families can't afford out-of-pocket costs. This data shows that the percent of non-poor families with liquid assets less than what their deductible is or what their out-of-pocket costs are so you can see that most people don't have money to cover what is responsible. I know for my family, it's a $3,000 deductible for each of us, for me, myself, my husband, and my daughter. We all have to meet that separately. I'm sure many of you have similar experiences. And PNHP's research shows that medical debt drives bankruptcy. Most people who file for bankruptcy, it's linked to medical debt, to healthcare costs. But most people who filed for bankruptcy actually had private health insurance. So you have coverage, but it doesn't protect you when you need it. And the reason is it's kind of obvious. One, the out-of-pocket costs are outrageous. Two, uh, you get sick, you lose your job, you lose your health insurance, right? This is the New York Times writing in 2015, many say high deductibles make their health law insurance plans all but useless. And I expect many people in the room can relate to this challenge of do you have enough in your bank account to deal with whatever health care costs you may have. Um, the New York State bronze plan, because of course it's like this Olympic medal of tiered available plans, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. If you're looking at a bronze plan in 2017 for your family, the premium is $12,500 but that comes with an $8,000 deductible and an out-of-pocket maximum of $14,300 with income-based adjustments. But it's very, this is a lot of money, folks. The average family income, of course, is about $57,000 in New York. Um, and there's co-insurance where you get charged after certain procedures where they have an ambulance ride or uh, an outpatient visit. Question. How many people in that um, I think it's family of four. Okay, well, maybe it's because people in the U.S. are, you, you know, we're sicker, we use healthcare more, that's why healthcare is so expensive, right? And you'll hear that argument too, well, it's because New Yorker, or it's because people are fat and smoke too much in the U.S., that must be why we have expensive healthcare. Well, when you look at the data, hospital inpatient days are about average, we're certainly not off the charts there. Physician visits are actually quite low. We see the doctor about four times a year versus almost 13 in Japan. That might be on the high end, but we're not using the doctor more. We don't have a particularly old population compared to these other countries with uh, universal health care. We actually don't smoke more than, other, than people in countries with universal health care. We're about 13%. France is way beating us at 23% smokers. So despite spending more than any other country on healthcare, not using healthcare more than folks in countries with universal healthcare, our health outcomes are, are really shameful. We're gonna dig into some of those numbers. So life expectancy trails other developed countries. It's about, on average, 70, um, almost 79, um, compared to the gains that other folks have made on that front. We still have a huge uninsured population. This shows over time the decline in insurance. 1942 estimated projections in 2020 not involving what Trump and the Republicans were trying to do. This is based on the ACA um, basically impact. And you can see this big drop here 
in uh, the 1960s is due to the implementation of Medicare and Medicaid, arguably the most significant social insurance expansion in healthcare. Um, and then we have alluded up leading up to the passage of the Affordable Care Act. You know, we were up to over 50 million at that time and have declined, but you're still, we still have 30 million, 28 to 30 million folks who are uninsured, even now, even you know, with the Affordable Care Act basically fully implemented, there were some states clearly that didn't expand Medicaid, and so there are people who aren't getting coverage who would had it been um, fully implemented. Uh, but yeah, we, unlike other countries, have a very large uninsured population, and because of that, we have preventable deaths. So the estimates in 2015, um, so there were 28,000, uh, almost 29,000 unnecessary deaths because people who had, would have had timely access to care uh, would have been able to deal with their conditions. This number would have ballooned or will balloon if the Republicans go forward um, with their efforts to repeal and cut health care. So when people are uninsured, that does literally equal unnecessary deaths. This shows years of life lost per 100 people for all causes, much higher than other developed countries. Um, I think this is most shameful that maternal mortality is so high in this country. Again, so many of these deaths are preventable. And in fact, there's an unprecedented increase in more maternal mortality in every other country developed country in the world, it is declining, and here it's increasing. And you can see the number here in Texas between 2000 and 2014, that it's up to almost 36%. And this is because of poverty and lack of access to health care. I mean, that's what it boils down to. And these are systemic issues that we could solve. In New York, we have uh, persistent racial health disparities, and of course this is reflected in the country as well. Access to health care, like I said, is a component of this, though not the whole story here. Uh, there's a whole conversation around the social determinants of health and structural racism, but when you look at the map, you have Central Brooklyn, South Bronx, East Harlem as the highest concentrations of childhood asthma, for example, but take any chronic health condition and you have the same map. The people who are poorest, the people who have black and brown skin are suffering the most from the current system's inadequacies. Uh, but frankly, even Americans with above average incomes compared to other countries have worse access to care. So you'll see here, um, USA is in blue on the left, uh, light blue on the right is mean the average of uh, 10 industrialized countries. It shows that in the first category, 17% of folks reported that they didn't see a doctor, 11% reported they didn't uh, get a test that was required or fill a prescription or wait. Actually, this is interesting, but the wait time is pretty much equal. 11% uh, of folks reported waiting over six days for an appointment. Um, and that's something that we'll hear the opposition, opposition argue. Wait times are going to be horrible. Well, like, who gets to see their doctor the next day now? It's not, you know, my relationship with my doctor. So wait times currently exist in the current system. So every other country covers all their citizens, spends half what we do. And why is this? Well, essentially, when the US model decided to base uh, our healthcare system on, frankly, employment, you get health insurance through your employer, largely in this country, other countries started expanding government-controlled health insurance, whether it's a specific single-payer program, which is a publicly financed system, but all the doctors and hospitals remain privately delivered, or socialized medicine when everything is public, or highly, highly regulated private health insurance companies. I mean, they're all able to keep health care costs down and uh, cover everyone. And that is why we argue that we need to push for the gold standard for a single payer model uh, that is much simpler than the chart that I showed you earlier, the chaotic health care system. In a single payer system, we have businesses and people, a combination of we advocate an employer uh, or a, a payroll tax split between the employer and the employee. You pay your income-based premium or tax, uh, which is another word that the opposition is going to throw around a lot of scary, scary taxes. And it's like very frustrating, but you pay it to a public insurance plan and they pay the doctor and hospital, 
when you need to go to the uh, to go seek care. Uh, the first question would not be, "Hi, how are you going to pay for this?" It would be, "Hi, how can I help you today?" Uh, there would be no no exchange at that point of delivery of money. That's an important part of a healthcare system that functions. Um, and this was covered in the um, in the short video, but you know we advocate for a system that covers literally everybody. Uh, we argue covering all um, U.S. citizens in a national Medicare for All plan, and in the New York Health Act, we argue everyone should be covered, but but actually not just limited to citizens, all residents. We have lots of working people here who aren't considered. Um, uh, you know, legal immigrants, and we think everybody who's working and living in this country should have access to health care, and we know we can do it. Um, all medically necessary services would be covered, and that includes reproductive health care, that includes abortion and contraception, and vision and dental and long-term care. A lot of folks I talk to have gray hair and get really excited about that, but um, you would, there wouldn't be a narrow network imposed by your insurance company. You could go to your choice of doctor or hospital or midwife, qualified provider, um, again, no financial barriers to care, no co-payments or deductibles, everything is paid through a progressive uh, tax and also some tax on the wealthy. Um, and this would do a lot for creating an equitable, equitable access to the delivery system in terms of how it's financed. In our current system, there is real discrimination that happens based on the kind of health insurance that you have. If you have Medicaid, uh, there's fewer providers that will take you. You're more likely to see doctors in training, harder to get to specialists. We're talking about leveling the playing field here. Everybody has the same access to the high quality healthcare services that we have in New York and in the country. Turns out this is pretty popular. So polling shows when asked, you want Medicare for all, most people say yes. Uh, Democrats, it's like off the charts, over 80% um, support the concept of Medicare for all. When asked, do you support expanded universal Medicare for all? Interestingly, uh, independence also very high, 60% of folks support. And uh, we're seeing growing support in the Republican base as well. So 30% of respondents say they're in favor of it. And actually, depending on how you ask the question, you know, if you say, do you support replacing the ACA with a federally funded system for Medicare for all? Um, still, 58% of overall adults support that. Democrats a little lower than, than Medicare for All. Interestingly, 41% of Republicans respond saying, yes, we support federally funded health care for all Americans. And I think this is a really important thing to remember because this is such a divisive time in our country. But when we break it down to what we're talking about in terms of access to health care, at least in the rank and file, it sounds like people are talking about the same thing. We want a universal system, we want it to be simpler, we want it to be accountable to us, we want to be able to access care in a simpler, easier way, and no matter what side of the aisle you're on, uh, people reach agreement. Uh, and I'm also pleased to say that physicians, majority of physicians, support single-payer health care, and that's been, I think, thanks to the work of PNHP over the years. Clearly, psychiatry is, is the highest, level of support and then it gets a little lower as you go sort of higher up the income bracket. Oh. So <laughs> surgery and radiology is, is on the lower end. So our bottom line is that single, single payer is the only way to cover everyone in a fiscally responsible way and, uh, and that's why we so strongly advocate for it. In New York, we have a bill uh, that essentially covers everyone, costs less, the same argument we've been saying this whole time. Um, as I mentioned, it passed three times in the Assembly. <coughs> I'm pleased to say in the Senate, we have exactly half of the U.S. Senate on board. We need one more senator to have a majority of the Senate. If you know anything about New York state politics, you know that that does not mean that it's going to pass, unfortunately, because the New York State Senate is controlled by Republicans. And while we have so much support within the Democratic Party, unfortunately, we don't have any Republicans signed on to the bill yet. So that means the Republican head of the Senate can stop um, the bill from passing. Senator Felder is the only Democratic senator who has not supported it. Senator Felder is what they call, he has, I think, called himself a nominal Democrat. He is, um, I think he was voted recently the most conservative legislator 
um, in the entire state. Um, he is not very friendly to our cause at the moment. He is, that's right, he represents Brooklyn, like the Borough Park area. Frankly, the people in his district would really benefit from this plan. So I covered all of these things. Uh, just to leave on an optimistic note here. So you would know who this is? What? No, but I, yeah, I do love him. Do you recognize him, anybody from Canada? This is Tommy Douglas, who is the father of Canadian Medicare, their uh, universal healthcare system. And uh, he is voted every year most popular Canadian. He's been dead a while. <laughs> um, people love him. They love him and they love their Medicare system. Obviously, Canadians get to complain about certain aspects of their healthcare system too, but it's wildly popular. I like to argue that that is a serious political legacy that is on the table in New York State and in the entire country. Who is going to bring truly universal healthcare uh, and enjoy the merits of being the most popular politician for many years to come. So I would argue that we have serious work to do ahead. Just sort of theoretically, we really need to challenge the opposition's claims that we can't afford um, this healthcare system. We have study after study that shows that we can provide healthcare at lower cost than we currently do. We have real examples from other countries around the world who are able to do it. It really, we, we have to challenge them and say, you know what, we actually can't afford the current system, both total healthcare dollars, but also us as individuals, we can't afford the system as it is. To um, raise the profile of real people's stories, and we saw that with Sarah, one of the assets that uh, the Action Blitz folks have worked on is a platform called OnStack, and over 50 people have submitted their personal testimonials through that. We hope to see that really explode and have just a surge of New Yorkers saying why this is important to them and frankly organized to change what is currently politically possible in New York and we've seen New York take on leadership on many progressive issues recently uh, the fight for 15 legalizing medical marijuana uh, marriage equality the state has a reputation for being progressive I think that we could really build the kind of movement that would push the folks in power to see this as very much in their best interest <laughs> to get behind it because the people are demanding it. And I hope you'll stay in touch with us. Um, uh, our national organization, pnhp.org, and our chapters info. And then we have a statewide coalition of groups, um, hundreds of organizations, unions, and many others who have partnered with the Campaign for New York Health. So I hope you will sign up. Stay in touch. Rappy, I probably talked too long. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. <laughs> um,